Chapter 18 The Land of Take What You Want The next day was very fine. The children helped their mother to clean the whole house and Joe proudly brought in some fine peas and lettuces from the garden which he had grown himself. His mother was very pleased. You can go off after lunch by yourselves if you'd like today, she said. You have been very good. The children looked at one another in glee, just what they had hoped. Good. Come on, said Joe after lunch. We won't waste any time. What about tea, said Bessie. Oughtn't we take some with us? I should think we could get tea all right from the land of take what you want, said Joe with a grin. So they all ran off, waving goodbye to Mother. They were soon in the enchanted wood, hearing the trees whispering secretly to one another, wish a wish a wish a wish a wish They ran through the bushes and trees to the faraway tree, and up they went. When they passed the window of the angry pixie, Joe peeped in just for fun. But he was sorry he did, for the angry pixie was there, and he threw a basin of soup all over poor Joe. Oh, said Joe in dismay, as he saw his shirt all splashed with soup. You're wicked, pixie. The angry pixie went off into peals of delighted laughter and banged his window shut. Pooh, you do smell of onions now, Joe, said Bessie, wrinkling up her nose. I hope the smell soon goes off. Joe wiped himself down with a handkerchief. He said to himself that one day he would pay the angry pixie out. Come on, said Fanny impatiently. We'll never get there. They passed the barn owl's door and saw him sitting inside fast asleep. They came to Silky's little yellow door too, but she was not in. There was a note pinned on her door which said, Out, back soon. She must be with Moonface, said Joe. Now just look out for Dame Washalot's water, everyone. It was a good thing he reminded them, for not long after that a fine waterfall of soapy suds came pouring down. Fanny screamed and dodged, as did Bessie. Joe got some on his shirt, and he was cross. Never mind, said Fanny with a giggle. It will wash off some of the onion soup, Joe. They went on up and came to Mr. What's-His-Names. He was, as usual, sitting in a deck chair, fast asleep, with his mouth open. And beside him, also fast asleep, was the old saucepan man, looking most uncomfortable, draped around, as usual, with saucepans and kettles. Don't wake them, whispered Joe. We'd better not stop and talk. So they crept by them. But just as they got to the next branch, the saucepan man woke up. He sniffed hard and poked Mr. What's-His-Name. "'What's the matter? What's the matter?' said his friend. "'Can you smell onions?' said the saucepan man. "'I distinctly smell them. "'Do you suppose the faraway tree is growing onions anywhere near us today? "'I love onion soup.' Joe and the girls laughed till they cried. It's the onion on your shirt that the saucepan man smelt, said Bessie. My goodness, they'll spend all afternoon looking for onions growing in on the faraway tree. They left the two funny old men and went climbing up. And they got nicely caught by Dame Washalot's second lot of water. She was doing a great deal of washing that day, and she emptied a big washing tub just as the three children were nearly underneath. Slishy, sloshy, slishy, sloshy, slishy, sloshy, slishy, slushy. The water came pouring down and soaked all the children. They gasped and shook themselves like dogs. Quick, said Joe, we will go as fast as we can to Moonface's house and borrow some towels from him. This is dreadful. They arrived at Moonface's at last. Old Moonface and Silky rushed out to hug them. But then they saw how dripping wet the children were. They stopped in surprise. Is it raining, said Moonface? Have you had a bath in your clothes, asked Silky. No, it's just Dame Washalot's water as usual, said Joe crossly. We dodged the first lot, but we got well caught by the second lot. Can you lend us towels? Moonface grinned and pulled some towels out of his curved cupboard. As the children rubbed themselves down, 
Moonface told them all about the land of Take What You Want. It's a marvellous land, he said. You are allowed to wander all over it and take whatever you want for yourselves without paying a penny. Everyone goes there if they can. Do come and visit it with me and Silky. Is it quite, quite safe? asked Joe, rubbing his hair dry. Oh, yes, said Silky. The only thing is we must be careful not to stay there too long in case it leaves the faraway tree and we can't get down. But Moonface says he will sit by the ladder and give a loud whistle if he sees any sign of the land moving away. Good, said Joe. Well, there are plenty of things we want, so let's go now, shall we? They all climbed up the topmost branch to the great white cloud. The ladder led through the hole as usual to the land above. One by one they climbed it and stood in the strange country above the magic cloud. It was indeed strange. It was simply crowded with things and people. It was quite difficult to move about. Animals of all kinds wandered here and there. Sacks of all sorts of things from gold to potatoes stood about. Stalls of the most wonderful vegetables and fruit were everywhere. And even such things as chairs and tables were to be found waiting for anyone to take them. Good gracious, said Joe. Can we really take anything we want? Anything, said Moonface, settling himself down by the ladder in the cloud. Look at those gnomes over there. They mean to take all the gold they can find. The children looked where Moonface was pointing. Sure enough, there were four gnomes, hauling all the sacks of gold in sight. One by one, they staggered off to the ladder with them and disappeared down the faraway tree. Other fairy folk hunted for different things they wanted. Dresses, coats, shoes, singing birds, pictures, all kinds of things. As soon as they had found what they were looking for, they rushed off to the ladder in glee and slipped down it. Moonface found it fun to watch them. The others wandered off, looking at everything in surprise. "'Do you want a nice fat lion, Joe?' asked Silky. As a large lion wandered by and licked Silky's hand. Um, no, thank you, said Cho at once. Well, what about a giraffe, said Silky. I believe they make fine pets. You believe wrong, then, said Bessie, as a tall giraffe galloped past like a rocking horse. Nobody in their senses would want to keep a giraffe for a pet. Oh, look, cried Fanny, as she came to a shop in which stood a great many large and beautiful clocks. Do let's take a clock back home. No, thank you, said Joe. We know what we want and we'll take that and nothing else. I think I should like a clock, said Silky, and she picked up a small clock and a very nice smiley face on it. It had two feet underneath, which waggled hard as Silky picked up the clock. It wants to walk, said Bessie, with a scream of laughter. Oh, do let it, Silky. I've never seen a clock walk before. Silky put the clock down and it trotted beside them on its big flat feet. The children thought it was the funniest thing they had ever seen. Silky was very pleased with her new clock. Just what I've always wanted, she said. I shall keep it at the back of my room. You don't suppose it will stay there, do you, Silky? asked Bessie. It will wander round and about and poke its nose into everything you're doing. And if it doesn't like it, it will run away. Ding dong, ding dong, said the clock suddenly in a clear voice, making them all jump. It stopped walking when it chimed, but it ran after the children and Silky again at once. It was really a most extraordinary clock. Now we really must look for what we want, asked Joe. Are those hens over there, Bessie? Yes, they are, said Bessie. Good, come along and we'll get them. Oh, this is really a lovely land. I am glad we came. What fun it will be getting everything we want. I do wonder what Mother will say when we get home. 